And as you're finding your seats, I'd love for you to turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 1. We'll be continuing our verse-by-verse look at this magnificent book. We humans readily assume that we are fit for heaven. When asked, do you think you'll go to heaven when you die? Many people today respond with, well, I think so. I hope so. If you ask, what do you think it takes to get there? You may hear responses like this. Well, just be sincere. God loves everybody. Just try to be good. You might follow up those statements with, well, do you think you've done what it takes? Well, nobody's perfect. I mean, I haven't killed anybody, or or the only people I have killed deserved it. Or, yeah, I've killed people, but I've never done what that other guy did. We measure ourselves by the sliding scale of behavioral merit. No matter what we've done or not done, we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. We always end up on the positive side of the scale. We assume our own goodness, despite the evidence. And we presume on God's tolerance, despite his word and his reputation. And we go about our business on his world, neglecting serious thought about eternity, serious thought about our sins, or serious thought about his justice. And what an awful day it will be for most who have cavalierly strolled down the broad path to destruction when they meet God in person. When the truth that absolute perfection is required and that no one could meet the standard becomes so clear. Only those who were given credit for a perfection they could never earn, only they will get in. For only the ones clothed in God's own perfect righteousness can survive God's blazing glory. John Owen wrote a book called The Glory of Christ. And the book is a commentary on John 17, 24. You remember Jesus' prayer in the upper room at that last supper with his disciples. And Jesus prayed the following, Father, I desire that they also whom you've given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. In that prayer, Jesus is asking that God would grant to those disciples gathered in that room to see Jesus for who he is. I'm gonna quote Owen a little bit here. This is not an exact quote he wrote in the 1600s, so some of this is my paraphrase. He said, all men indeed think themselves fit for glory, but it is because they know not what it is. Men will not be clothed with glory just because they want to be. It is to be received through spiritual equipment that they do not have. Music has no pleasure in it unto them that cannot hear nor the most beautiful colors unto them that cannot see. It would be no benefit unto a fish to take him up from the bottom of the ocean filled with cold and darkness and to place him under the beams of the sun. For he is not fit to receive refreshment thereby. Heaven itself would not be more advantageous unto persons not renewed by the spirit of grace in this life. Do you understand what John Owen is saying? As much as we think it might be nice to go to heaven, if you show up there unprepared, you will meet the Christ of Revelation 1 in all of his blazing glory. And if you are not covered by his blood and forgiven of your sins, it will not be good for you. Let's read together this text. Revelation 1, beginning in verse 13. I saw in the middle of the lampstands one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. 
And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living run and I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Therefore write, the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. In this scene, the resurrected Christ gave to his beloved disciple, his glory-stricken disciple, comfort and assignment and an explanation. We're looking this morning at verses 17 through 20. And it begins with the response of John at seeing the glorified Christ we looked at last week. The one whose voice was like the sound of many waters and whose face shone like the sun in its strength. Look at verse 17. John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. This response by John is normal. This is the normal response of a mortal coming into the presence of the uncloaked glory of God. Old Testament prophets had these experiences. Listen to Ezekiel 1. There was a figure with the appearance of a man, and I noticed from the appearance of his loins and upward something glowing like metal. It looked like fire all around within. And from the appearance of his loins and downward, I saw something like fire, and there was a radiance around him. As the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice speaking. In another vision, Ezekiel says, I got up and I went out to the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord was standing there, and I fell on my face. In Ezekiel 44, another vision, Ezekiel records, he brought me by way of the north gate to the front of the house. I looked and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord and I fell on my face. Daniel had this same experience in seeing Christ before his incarnation. Daniel writes, I lifted my eyes and looked and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen. His waist was girded with a belt of pure gold, his body like beryl, His face had the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. The men who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, great dread fell on them. They ran away to hide themselves. I was left alone and saw the great vision. No strength was left in me. My natural color turned to deathly pallor. I retained no strength. I heard the sound of his words, and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. John's experience in Revelation 1 is normal. John, of course, had had other experiences with Christ during Jesus' earthly ministry. You may remember back to that Last Supper. The disciples were gathered there in an upper room and they were around a low table. They didn't sit on chairs. They reclined on the floor and they reclined on each other. You remember the description there that John was comfortably reclining against Jesus' breast. There is an intimacy, a closeness, a a camaraderie, a friendship. In fact, John called himself in the third person the disciple whom Jesus loved. He never got over to the fact that this Jesus loved him. But now this same John, in the presence of the same Jesus, falls like a dead man at his feet. What's different? Christ's glory is uncloaked, unleashed. The glory he has always possessed, but that glory that was eclipsed by his humble humanity while on the earth, it is now on full display. And John, falling down on his face like a dead man, is totally reasonable. This was the experience of many who saw the glory of the incarnate son. In Judges 13, Manoah and his wife fell on their faces when they encountered him. Job 42 describes Job saying, Now my eye sees the Lord and I repent in dust and ashes. 
In Acts 26, Paul was recounting his own experience with the glorified risen Christ. He says, at midday, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul was floored and blinded. In Luke 5, we get an interesting story about the disciples. They were fishing, and Jesus directed them where to catch fish, and the nets were full. And when Simon realized, Simon Peter realized that God was in the boat, he fell down at Jesus' feet, and he says, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. You remember in the Old Testament, Moses radiated. He went off the charts on the Geiger counter. His face was glowing from being in the presence of God's glory, and so much so that the Israelites made Moses cover his face. The mere reflection on his face from having been in the presence of God's glory was too much for the people to bear. And then when angels have appeared on the earth, the, the ones who reside in the presence of that glory, they are so terrifyingly brilliant that when mortal men meet them, they become petrified in fear and they fall down catatonic. John here in Revelation 1 is not dead. He fell down as dead, but he is very much alive. By the Spirit, he has been ushered into the glorious presence of God and his senses are tuned. He is stunned, stupefied, petrified, terror-stricken. And all of this should put an end to silly ideas of casually strolling into God's presence, being glib with God or flippant, or thinking that we and God are buddies. Reading about John's experience ought to provoke in us humility, contrition, and confession. You remember Isaiah's cry, Woe is me. He's calling down heavenly damnation upon himself in the presence of God. He says, woe unto me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I've seen the glory of the king. And there's comfort here in verse 17. Notice what John writes. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, don't fear. This right hand that held the stars, the right hand is the hand of power and authority, delivers a touch. And this touch from the terrifying one is a touch of comfort. It is personal and compassionate. The one who holds all things in his sovereign grip now reaches down to console, to assure John, the hand that bore the nail of Calvary's cross now expresses love and comfort to the beloved disciple. And notice verse 17, John tells us he placed his right hand on me saying, and now there is this familiar voice. It had been six decades since John had heard the voice of Jesus on the earth, but John would have remembered that voice and he would have remembered the familiar words that follow. Look what Jesus says, do not fear, I am Literally here it is, stop fearing. It recognizes that John is terror stricken already and here is encouragement from the terrifying one to not fear anymore. These words, do not fear, are often spoken to trembling mortals when they've encountered the living God. John himself had heard these words before. You remember Matthew 17, Peter, James, and John are on that mountain of transfiguration and Jesus took them up on a high mountain, was transfigured before them and uncloaked for a few moments, radiating in blinding glory. They all fell on their faces and Jesus said, after touching them, do not fear. Same words, same touch. In Mark 6, 50, Jesus was walking across the water in a storm to the fishermen in the boat. And he says, do not fear, I am. 
We translate that, it is I. But, but it is that I am statement that we're familiar with. Notice it comes up here. Do not fear, he says to John, I am. These were familiar words to John. John is the one who wrote out those seven I am statements in his gospel. Jesus said, I am the door and the good shepherd and the way and the truth and the life, culminating in John eight fifty eight, where Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. This is Jesus' self-designation as the self-existing God of the Old Testament in the flesh. It is a reference to the divine name in Exodus 3.14 where we get our English word Yahweh. It is embedded in the very name of God, this self-existence. And and Jesus the Christ is none other than the self-existent Son of God. And he says here to John, do not fear, I am. And he says, verse 17, notice this, I am the first and the last. This is similar to the phrases we get throughout the book of Revelation, the alpha and the omega, that's like A to Z in the Greek alphabet, or the beginning and the end. That is, Jesus here is claiming what is only true of God. These are phrases used in the Old Testament of Yahweh. That he is the origin of everything and the termination of everything. It's another way of saying from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be all glory. Jesus here is assuring John that he is the sovereign, the supreme in charge of all events. All of history is in his hand. All of history is rushing toward his being glorified and this first and the last will be glorified. Whether in salvation of believers or through judgment for all who refuse him. And what a comfort this was to John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. That familiar touch, that familiar voice, those familiar words from the same glorious one that made him fall to the ground as though dead. He is truly the one who can comfort. He comforts us mortals as we walk through the troubling times that we face, uncertain futures, even as we endure persecution for following him. This scene, by the way, makes clear how foolish it is to live for now. Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. Who cares? Carpe diem. Living for immediate gratification or for temporal happiness. Putting all your eggs in the basket of this life and and hoping to eke out satisfaction from life here. To live for yourself for a few fleeting moments will only land you in the presence of the one who is the first and the last. You cannot escape Jesus. You're hearing me now talk to you about Christ and and maybe he's not Lord of your life. Maybe you have not had your guilt removed by his blood. Maybe you have not had your sins forgiven at the cross. You might be hoping for a way to just ignore him and, and get on with your life. And you might get a few more minutes here on God's earth. You might get a few decades. Doesn't make a lot of difference. Where does your life end? Right here with the one who is the end. As your maker, he was your beginning. As your judge, he will be your ending and you cannot escape Jesus. Come to him now as savior so that you will not have to meet him as judge. And then you too can experience what John experienced in this scene, the love of God through Christ. And you could cry out with all believers as Paul does in Colossians 1, we give thanks to the Father who qualifies us to share in the inheritance of saints in light. You see, you don't have what it takes to get there on your own. You must be qualified by God from that which is outside of you by his grace. Verse 18 continues, I am the first and the last and the living one. The living one. This is a contrast to the false gods in the Old Testament. God would call himself, refer to himself as the true and living God. Old Testament oaths were taken uh, by Yahweh who lives, by the God who lives forevermore. This is a contrast to all those inanimate deities that people worshiped in vain. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't eat, they couldn't drink, they couldn't provide uh, grain for your crops. They couldn't do any of those things because they aren't. They don't exist. They're either merely man-made things or demons. They are not the true God. Jesus is the one true God. He, He takes this title of the living one 
And he says, and I was dead. I was dead. Literally, Jesus says here, and I became dead. I am the living one, and I became dead. It is a striking way to say this. There is an easy way in Greek for Jesus to say, and I was dead, or I died. He doesn't do either of those here. He says, and I became dead. It, it's almost shocking the way it's written. The living one, the, the one who has life in himself, John 5, 26, became what? Dead? The one who is the life, John 14, 6, became dead? The author of life became dead? Yes, this, this is what Christ came to do the first time he came. The self-existent, eternal one who had life in himself became dead. The living one transitioned into deadness. Now here, John says he fell down as dead, but the living one who always was became dead, actually dead. Jesus in his humanity actually experienced real physical death. But behold, verse 18... Check this out, he says. I am alive forevermore. I am the living one, and I transitioned into being dead, and I am very much alive now. This is a comfort particularly related to Jesus' human, physical, bodily resurrection. Jesus is the first fruits of all who believe in him, that we will transcend mortality and one day be united to a glorious physical resurrection body. The reality of Jesus' physical resurrection as a man is a comfort and encouragement to those who will face death in this life. You remember for 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus met with the disciples teaching them. He ate with them and drank with them. It was a real human body. And here Jesus says, don't fear, John. It's me. I became dead. I'm very much alive. You need not fear death. In fact, you need not fear anything. And that is the truth for all those who fear God. You have nothing else to fear. You get in a right relationship with the one who is the biggest and the scariest. And he's on your side and he loves you. And there is nothing to be afraid of. Jesus says, I have the keys of death and of Hades. Death is the separation of body and soul. It's when the material and the immaterial you are segmented. They are disintegrated. Death separates the material you from the immaterial you. And, and Hades is the holding place of the wicked dead. It is where all those who don't believe go and wait for final judgment. And Jesus says, I have the keys of death in Hades. That means Jesus is in charge. He, he, he's the one who locks and unlocks. He's the one who opens and shuts. And he's the one that has authority, total mastery over death and Hades. He is in charge of when our lives here are done. Not the Roman emperors, not persecutors, not sickness, not wars, not accidents, not natural disasters or diseases. Jesus is in charge of death. And Jesus is in charge of our destinations after death. Look, you place yourself in Christ by faith and you have the guarantee that the one who keeps you keeps you to the end and secures your destination with him. Do not fear. The Christians that John was writing to would face severe tests for following Christ. One had been killed, some others would be killed. And throughout church history, many have suffered as they followed Christ. But the attributes of Christ, his resurrected humanity, his total authority, and his eternal deity would be a tremendous comfort to them and a tremendous comfort to us. After giving John comfort, Jesus next gives John an assignment. It's in verse 19. He commands John, therefore, write the things you've seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. This pattern of seeing a vision of the glorified God, being devastated on your face, and then being comforted by that same God, and then being given an assignment. It happens throughout prophetic literature. 
Uh, this happened, of course, with the Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. It, it now happens to John. John sees the glorified Christ. He's on his face as a dead man. Then he's comforted by Christ. And then he's commissioned with a task. Here is John's task. Write. And he's commanded to write in a threefold content. This becomes the outline of the book of Revelation. In fact, Revelation 119 is sort of the key for understanding the whole rest of the book. Not every book in your Bible starts out with an outline, but it's really helpful that that's here. It sort of tells you the, the roadmap for understanding the book of Revelation. Jesus commands John, first of all, write the things that you saw, and it's a past tense verb. Uh, that, what did John just see? He saw the vision of the exalted Christ in chapter 1. That is the first segment is chapter one and the vision of Christ glorified. Secondly, Jesus commands John, write the things which are. The things which are in John's day. This is present tense from John's perspective. That is the current state of the churches in John's day. And that's exactly what we get in Revelation 2 and 3. What's going on in the, the lampstands, the, the churches that Jesus is walking amidst? What is their spiritual condition? What are their weak points? Where do they need to be encouraged? How do they need to be addressed, even rebuked and warned? So write out the present situation. And then thirdly, he says, the things which will take place after these things. That is, after the present state of affairs, there are events which will take place. And so from chapter 4 to chapter 22 is all future from John's standpoint. And he is to write out the future. That's an interesting task. Writing a history book before the stuff happens. And it's 100% accurate. And you know what history books are, right? History books are just what somebody wrote. If, if you've studied historiography, <laughs> events happen and then people write about it. That may accord with truth or it may not. But these events absolutely accord with truth because the literal future history for the world in which we live has already been written by God who is sovereign over everything that will take place. And so John is to write it out. That future section starts in chapter 4. And chapters 4 and 5 depict a throne room scene where Jesus Christ is worshipped as the only one worthy to usher in God's future judgments on the earth. And then chapter 6, chapter 6 through 18 begins a series of judgment events from heaven against the earth. That is a reflection of Daniel's 70th week, if you remember back to Daniel's prophecy the seven-year period of judgments that will bring an end to the era of sinful mankind's destruction of God's earth. That takes you from chapters 6 to 18 in the book. Chapter 19 brings about the return of Christ to the earth, followed by chapter 20, which is Jesus' reign as king on the earth for a thousand years, followed by final judgment. And then the last two chapters of the book, chapters 21 and 22, depict the new heavens and the new earth, the eternal state and into eternity future. So from chapter four on, everything is future. It's helpful that Jesus gave us this outline, uh, this outline of the book right up front. It's very clear. And it's interesting to note that the chronology of Revelation does not cross the borders of that outline. The book unfolds just the way that Jesus told John to write it here in verse 19. There's a really interesting phrase here in verse 19, and it is the, the, the little prepositional phrase at the end. After these things, after these things. It happens to be an important phrase in prophetic literature. Turn to chapter four and verse one. And we get this phrase twice in chapter four, verse one. And you remember chapter four begins the third division of the book, the future division of the book. And John begins, after these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, a voice that I heard like a sound of trumpet saying, come up here, I will show you what must take place after these things. Verse one begins and ends with that same phrase, after these things. This is sort of a technical, temporal marker. And you're gonna see these throughout the book of Revelation. It tells you that the chronology is progressing. 
It sort of tells you when things happen. One thing happens after another. And, and you can't miss those markers. You can't ignore them and jumble around the events of Revelation and get a different interpretation. That violates what Jesus is revealing in this book. There's something else interesting about this phrase. This picks up from Daniel chapter 2. Daniel 2.29, my English Bible reads this way, in the future, but it is literally the same words, after these things. And this intentional wording in Daniel 2 and in Revelation 1 tie the vision of the Old Testament prophet Daniel to the visions of the New Testament prophet John and end up detailing the same events in the same time frame. What's interesting about Daniel's prophecy is that Daniel was commanded to seal up his prophecy because those events were not imminent. From Daniel's day, other things had to happen first, and we covered that in our study of the book of Daniel. All that intertestamental period, the 400 BC to the, to the first coming of Christ, the exact timing of the coming of Christ, down to when he would enter Jerusalem as Israel's king and then be rejected. The, the death of Christ was prophesied there. And then a whole lot of other things, including the destruction of, of Jerusalem. All of these things had to happen before the after these things events. And while Daniel was told to seal up his prophecy, because all the first coming of Christ stuff had to happen first, John is commanded not to seal up his prophecy because these things must happen soon. What does that mean? These events are imminent. In other words, nothing else prophetically must take place before these last things take place. This is why the New Testament can speak of us in the church age being in the last days already, even though the events of God's seven-year judgment have not yet started. Jesus gave to John comfort and then an assignment and then thirdly, Jesus gave to his beloved disciple an explanation. Look down at verse 20. Jesus explains two symbols. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. John here gets an explanation. Specifically an explanation of two symbols from the vision. And it begins with the word mystery. Mystery here just means something that was secret, something that was hidden, that is now revealed. It has to be revealed to be understood. But once it is revealed, it's no longer a secret. It was once hidden, now it's disclosed. And what does he describe? The seven stars equal the seven angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Let's start with the churches first. They are symbolized by lampstands, and we talked about that a little bit last week. It means that the lampstand as the platform for the lamp is not what shines. What's supposed to shine? The, the light of the lamp shines. And for churches to be lampstands means that they are not the thing. They are not the light. They are a platform for the light. That's why when you get to the letters to the seven churches, Jesus says, I will remove your lampstand out of its place if you are not faithful. That is, the church doesn't get to be a platform for the gospel anymore, for the light of Christ and for the truth of God's word, if it doesn't live up to what it should be. And we also learn there that Jesus walks among the lampstand, a, a stark picture of Jesus' special presence and his intimate involvement with his churches. And then we get the explanation of the stars in the right hand of Christ. John is told by Jesus, the seven stars are the seven angels of the churches. Now there are a number of views about what this means. I don't often walk through a bunch of alternative views and try to prove to you why I think the, the view that I'm holding is the right one. Uh, this might be a place to do that. There, if you read about the book of Revelation, if you're reading through commentaries, you're reading in a study Bible, you'll see a couple of different views. Uh, I'll give you all the views I was able to find that are out there. Number one, that angels are supernatural beings, like we normally think of angels. Number two, that these angel stars represent the spirit of each church, 
kind of like the prevailing attitude of the church, or these angels are human messengers. The, the word angel, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, um, means messenger. And while most uses of the Bible in the Bible refer to supernatural beings, there are a number of occasions that clearly refer to human messengers. For instance, in Judge six, Judges 6, the angel of Yahweh and Gideon's human messengers show up in the same passage, both with the word angel. In Genesis 32, you have supernatural and human messengers. In Isaiah 37, you have supernatural and human messengers, all of which use the same words for angel in those passages. So the view here would be that these messengers or angels are human delegates. Uh, They're delegates from Asia, from that Roman province where those seven churches are, and they were sent to John in his imprisonment, maybe to care for him, bring him a meal, give him some encouragement, but they would be sent back as messengers carrying the letters to the churches. And so you have to the angel or to the messenger of the church at Ephesus, write. That's the idea. A fourth view says these are human messengers, something like letter carriers, the the postman. The, The postman on the circular road that connects those seven churches, he's delivering the mail. A fifth view, I think we're on five, is that these human messengers are pastors of the local churches that they are seen as the singular representatives of the spiritual condition of each church, and they are charged by Christ to give the encouragement, admonition, or warning that each church requires. And then a final view says these human messengers are bishops, that is, they are regional pastors over other pastors in a hierarchical structure. Uh, That view would be anachronistic. Uh, There weren't bishops this early in church history. I won't walk you through all the pros and cons of each view, but I would like to describe for you why I believe the reference here is to supernatural beings. I believe the correct understanding of angels here is our usual understanding of the word angel. An unfallen, supernatural being with access to heaven and earth, commissioned by God to serve his saints during their earthly pilgrimage. And I want to draw this out for you because I think there are significant implications for seeing that angels are involved with what we do as a church. So here's a few clues. The Greek word for angel, you ready to learn a Greek word? Angel, you already knew it. That's the Greek word. The angel here, here's a a second clue. Uh, The angels here are said to be symbolized by what? Verse 20. Stars. So if the angels here are to be an emblem of something else, then you would have sort of this symbol of a symbol or a metaphor of a metaphor. The stars are angels, which are actually pastors, bishops, postmen, whatever the other view you would take. Um, I think that's a stretch here, especially since Jesus is making clear what the symbol is. The symbol is the star, the actual referent of the symbol is an angel. Third clue, of the 74 times the word angel appears in the book of Revelation, they all refer to supernatural beings, unless these ones are humans. Fourth clue, Hebrews 1.14 describes angels this way. They are ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. That's on an angel's business card. Angel shows up for work, punches in. Okay, God, what do you want me to do? I'm sending you out as ministering spirits sent to serve the elect who will inherit salvation. That's their job, according to Hebrews 1. Revelation 19.10, an angel speaking to John says, I'm your fellow slave, and I'm a slave of your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. In Revelation 22.9, an angel says to John, I'm a fellow slave of yours, and a fellow slave of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of the book. Again, angels are servants to believers. Clue number five. In Revelation 8, we read this. An angel came and stood at the altar in heaven, holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, so that he might add to it the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Okay, this is a remarkable scene on many counts. When you pray, Christian, you need to know your prayers, 
whether you feel like they've been answered in the way you thought you were praying them or not, end up as a precious commodity in heaven, as a matter of worship before the Lord. Every time you pray in Jesus, your prayers matter to God. They are worship before him, they are pleasing to him. I don't know what to do, God help. That's in a golden bowl in heaven. And notice also how the angel is involved with this. Um, The angels are depicted as being involved in the happenings of saints on the earth, even representing them in heaven. Here's prayers of the saints. I'm gonna put it in the golden bowl of incense and it's gonna be a pleasing aroma to the Lord. It's a matter of worship in the throne room in heaven. All right, clue six. Daniel 10, 13 and Daniel 12, 1. We looked at these when we studied through the book of Daniel. Both describe angels whose job is supervision over territories and nations. God has assigned certain of these ministering spirits to actually battle in the cosmic realm against cosmic forces on behalf of his people. And clue number seven, Matthew 18 and Acts 12, 15, both refer to angelic involvement in human affairs. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 18. Do not despise one of my little ones, speaking of precious believers, For I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What is Jesus saying there? Don't mess with my people. They got angels. And those angels have access to earth and to heaven and they somehow have something to do with representation before God. And then Acts 12, 15 refers to Peter's angel. Uh, Some of the people who were praying for Peter to get out of jail heard a knock on the door and it was Peter and then the doorkeeper didn't let him in. Oh, it's probably his angel, they said. Well, that's in the same context that an angel angel, a supernatural being, actually sprung Peter from jail. Those are interesting indications about angelic involvement in human activity. And for the sake of curiosity, I'll give you one more. 2 Corinthians 11. This is going to answer all of your questions about 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11 is not what I'm looking for. 1 Corinthians 11. Verse 10. Therefore the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. Why? Because of the angels. That answered all your questions about head coverings and answered all your questions about angelic involvement in human affairs. (laughs) What are the implications? Why why is this important? Why why do we get this view of angelic involvement in church activities? I think, first of all, this elevates our view of church. We're not just about merely terrestrial activity, human business, human programs. There is a cosmic reality to the church. Listen to Ephesians 3.10. God puts his manifold wisdom and makes it known through the church to rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. God there is talking about angelic beings and probably they're demonic ones, evil angelic beings, principalities and powers. And God is doing something through us humans on the earth in the church, taking the gospel to the ends of the earth and doing the stuff that we do in church. All of that is a cosmic showcase for God's wisdom before supernatural beings. That's what the church is doing all the time. Secondly, there is corporate representation before heaven of a local assembly of believers. The local church is a body, that is we are interdependent. When one part suffers, the whole suffers, there is a corporate reality. According to the letters to the churches in Revelation two and three, the churches stand or fall together. Listen, you individual Christian have your obligation to be faithful to the Lord no matter what the church is doing. But the church thrives or withers on the basis of all of our individual involvement together as a corporate entity. That's why we're called a body. And that corporate entity, that that corporate reality is even represented in the singular subjects and the singular verbs in those letters all headed up by a singular angel. There's a third implication for us. We have help, angelic assistance. We don't see, we don't know how, we don't know when. We may entertain angels, but that would be unawares, Hebrews says. 
But this would be comfort for the tiny bands of persecuted Jesus followers. Do you remember Elisha's servant in 2 Kings 6? Elisha the prophet said, I know you think we're outnumbered. It's just the two of us and the whole Aramean army. And, and what did Elisha pray? Lord, open his eyes. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and what did he see? On the mountains and the hills surrounding armies of chariots of fire. These are God's supernatural beings that are involved in the conflict. And Elisha's servant thought it was just two dudes. This is much bigger than us. It's a comfort. Fourth, just a reminder that our battle is not with flesh and blood. It is with powers and principalities and the dark forces of this world. We speak truth, we herald God's word, we preach the gospel with men, we do that all in the realm of ideas, right? We're not out there trying to find demons or destroy them with some secret weapons or anything like that. Our weapons are God's word and faithful proclamation, prayer, but behind all of that battle is a spiritual battle, a cosmic battle. And this is a reminder for us that what we do here is not merely a flesh. Fifth and related is just a reminder of the heavenly dimension of our spiritual fight. The angels of the churches are not accountable for the church's sins. They're sinless beings. They're not held to account. They they don't need to repent. But it is an encouragement to us to know that God has appointed these supernatural servants to do what they can in the cosmic realm, whatever is needed, however God designs. We know that Satan is active in the church. In fact, 1 Timothy 5 tells us that Satan was active in the ministry, the women's ministry, at the church at Ephesus, one of the recipients of this very letter. Satan gets involved in the church. Paul calls all false doctrine, doctrines of demons. This is spiritual warfare. And so we have to remember the heavenly dimension of this spiritual fight. And here God has supplied a window into the knowledge of our heavenly help for our earthly pilgrimage. This just lifts our gaze when we think about church. I think that's the intent here. As we close this vision of the exalted Christ, we would be remiss to move on from him? As if, okay, yep, saw Christ, check that box. Let's get on to the exciting stuff. Who are the 144,000? Who's the woman riding the beast? What are those two beasts, one out of the sea and one out of the land? What's that other beast? What are all these symbols? Who are the two witnesses? We could get into all of those things in a way that misses Christ. And I would just encourage us that Revelation 1 does not exist here so that we move on from it. This, again, is the revelation of Christ. The the judgments that will flow out in Revelation 6 through 18 are the judgments of Jesus against earth dwellers, all anticipating his personal arrival on the earth in chapter 19. So we don't forget this scene and... It would be an emptiness to master all the details of the book of Revelation and to neglect the benefits of regular, sustained contemplation of the glory of Christ. So I'll close this with a few more words from John Owen. He writes, The constant contemplation of the glory of Christ will give rest, satisfaction, and complacency unto the souls of them who are exercised therein. Our minds are apt to be filled with a multitude of perplexed thoughts, fears, cares, dangers, distresses, passions, and lusts. They do make various impressions on the minds of men. They fill them with disorder and darkness and confusion. But where the soul is fixed in its thoughts and contemplations on this glorious object, it will be brought into and kept in holy, serene, spiritual frame. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. And this it does by taking off our hearts from all undue regard under the things below in comparison of the great worth and beauty and glory of what we are conversant with all. A defect herein makes many of us strangers unto heavenly life and to live beneath the spiritual refreshments and satisfactions that the gospel gives us freely. Would we have access to gospel, truth, gospel, comfort, glory of Christ encouragement, we must come back here and think of him often. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this revelation of yourself to us. 
what kind mercies you have given to the undeserving, that we might see you through your word. And we grasp these things by faith. We will sing of them with our voices. But one day, Lord, we pray one day soon, we will see them with our eyes. Hasten that day, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Be vindicated in the world and vindicated in our own hearts for your glory. Amen.